So <laughs> I, I see that everyone has made it back from lunch. Congratulations. That was excellent. I'm happy. <coughs> Actually, I would like to go sleep, <laughs> but I don't think I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> Th there, there is a rather well-known picture of, of um, a DNS training course in, in Bali in Indonesia some years ago. At the time, you couldn't run the entire training class on, on just one box, so we had four rack servers next to each other, and it was lots of equipment and lots of noise, and also lots of students. And we were four trainers, because we had 45 students or something. The picture is of the table with the four rack servers on it, creating lots and lots of noise, and my feet sticking out underneath that table, because there were so many other trainers, I, I could take a nap. And being really, really jet lagged, it really doesn't matter if you have a bunch of rack servers just on top of your head. You <laughs> just sleep through that. <laughs> but now, now stuff isn't as noisy anymore, so that's good. Um, get, getting getting further into into the actual DNSic part of this, um, to a large extent, this is actually DNSic in one slide. So. There, there are a few more tweaks and, and twists and, and details, etc., to go through, but in essence, this is DNSSEC. If you have a key, and this key can be used to sign stuff, that's stuff, and this is signature of stuff, then you can use that signature to verify the stuff. That's the whole point with the signature. If you can verify the signature, <coughs> You can, you can verify the stuff. Um, what makes this slightly more complicated or complex is that, yes, whoever does the validation must have this key. You need the key and the signature to be able to validate the stuff. So it has to be a public key based system because you want to be able to give out the public keys to anyone and you want to use the secret keys, the private keys, to actually generate the signatures. So we cannot use symmetric uh, cryptography for this. So the second problem is, OK, uh, given that you have this key, you can verify the signature. But how do you get the key? And how do you verify that it's the real key and not a spoofed key? I mean, if we're talking about spoofing just before lunch, Ma major surprise, these keys are stored in DNS. You look them up through DNS. Stuff that you look up through DNS can be spoofed. So th there is a bit of a chicken and egg problem here that we need to close to really make the system secure. But those details aside, this is how it works. Next tweak to, to make it slightly more correct is that it's not the case that the entire world is inside one DNS zone with one key that we use to sign everything. We have lots of zones and we have lots of keys. And when you have lots of keys, it's simply not possible to have all of those keys stored in a secure way inside every resolver everywhere that does the validation. So we need some sort of mechanism to get the keys in a safe way. And the way that works is by at the delegation point, and in this case we're talking about the delegation point between net and axfr.net, at the delegation point we have something in the parent that can be used to authenticate the key in the child. And once you have that design, if you trust the key for net, then you can use the signature of this thing to trust that thing. And if that thing authenticates this key, then suddenly you trust this key. And then you can use that key to verify this signature and you trust this data. So the trick here is how to bridge the zone cut. We had a whole bunch of different designs to do this bridging across the zone cut. The first attempt was that 
the parent generates a signature over that key and then we store the signature down in the child but that creates lots of back and forth communication that has to be secured and it doesn't work in practice the second design was that the parent creates a signature over this key and we store the signature in the parent instead that cut down on the amount of traffic but it still didn't work operationally because now and then he needs to change his keys and in the rollover scenario because the signature covers all the keys if you go back really really far into what we said this morning there was something called an RR set and we signed the RR sets so if we have multiple keys there will be one signature over the set of keys and when we start doing so-called so -called key rollovers like changing your password you move from one key to another key that's a complex mechanism and you need to first add the key and wait for a bit and then wait for a bit more and then you can remove the old key so you will have multiple keys in the interim and then this signature would have to be re regenerated every time you add keys to the set or remove keys from the set and there would be lots of communication back and forth back and forth all the time so it simply didn't work so our third idea was that instead of having a signature over all the keys of the child we have just something that identifies a single key in the child then he can add other new keys without this single key identification being compromised so that's what we're doing so this is actually just a sec so-called secure hash of one of the keys in the child and then this key can be used to sign both stuff and other keys so it, it's a so-called signature chain but it's somewhat convoluted it's not really straight it sort of bends and twists a bit but it does work operationally so the reason why it's so convoluted and twisting is to minimize the amount of operational complexity having the parent and child needed to talk to each other frequently in a secure way so that we minimize the amount of communication because that's one of the hardest parts with DNSSEC well it's one of the hardest parts of life sometimes talking to your parent so that's the thing that we need to minimize so among the DNSSEC services is a system for distribution of public keys because we need these public keys for for DNSSEC itself resolvers need to be able to get to the public keys to use them for verification etc that said there are many types of public keys once upon a time we had a record type called key and this record type was used to store public keys in general be it DNS keys or other public keys that turned out to be a horribly bad idea uh, if, if you if you're interested in the DNS history and you, you sort of look back at all the things you will see that there is a very long series of horrible mistakes being done and we, we think that we've fixed them but it's also one of the reasons why it's taken so long so every possible thing that could go wrong and that would turn out to be sort of a, a blind alley we've tried them all and eventually we, we found a path that sort of works it, it's like just like Winston Churchill said about the Americans you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else so that's a bit how the DNS design came to be so distribution of public keys for DNSSEC is part of DNSSEC and then other kinds of public keys can also be distributed through DNS but that's outside the scope of this and then we have signatures over over RR sets and we have all sorts of, of um, changes all over the place so this is intended to show the mechanics of how to generate a signature you, you have an unsigned RR set you compute a secure hash of that which is basically just a fingerprint of the data you sign that fingerprint by encrypting it with a private key and suddenly you have a signature you attach the signature to the RR set and suddenly you have a signed RR set at some later point in time 
assuming you have access to the corresponding public key, you can use that to verify this and, and then we're fine. Oops. We do not deal in confidentiality. That's not what the NSEC is about. We do not deal in access control. That's not what the NSEC is about. So the NSEC is really a narrow scope design to deal with one particular issue. And that is how to make it possible for the consumers of DNS information to verify the authenticity of the information they get. It's not about shielding information so that others cannot see it. It's not about etc. It's just about being able to verify the authenticity of the stuff that you're looking up. Nothing else. So there are mechanisms for these other things, but that's not part of the NSEC. And going back to this picture that you saw before lunch, well, I if you look at the, the entire transaction system here, with all sorts of transactions from, from loading of zone data into the master server, dynamic updates from various machines, zone transfers to slaves, queries from recursive name servers, queries from stub resolvers, etc. Uh, the other part of this, that part, and this part, what is it that makes them different? What is the primary difference between those two parts of the, of the problem space? It's not meant as a trick, trick question. So I, I'm not saying it's easy to see, but there is a fundamental difference here. And if you spot it, you will say, aha. The, the fundamental... Sorry? Well, yes, I do. Uh, but but I, I, want to I want to validate all of this. Uh, but, but the difference I'm after here is that over here, typically, if that's my laptop, and that's a recursive server in the hotel, we don't know each other. If that's the recursive server in a hotel or is in an ISP in Costa Rica and it's talking to my authoritative server uh, in Cape Town or wherever, those two guys don't know each other. However, over in this part of the picture, if my laptop sends dynamic updates back to my master server in Stockholm, th those two guys know each other, or rather we have the ability to set up a trust relationship between them because they are part of the the same framework. Same thing here, the master and the slave, those two guys know each other. If you don't know your slave, then perhaps you should get to know him. I mean, you see what I mean. I, is it, it's important to be able to trust the slave server to do the right thing, and you can exchange T6 secrets and all sorts of stuff. That simply does not work here, because we have millions and millions of zones with authoritative servers, and we have hundreds of thousands of recursive servers, and the complete matrix of, of trust relationships there is just not possible to pre-configure. And the same thing, obviously, uh, is true here. So when the authentication problem is of limited scope, as in the number of entities involved is sufficiently small that you can pre-configure this through shared secrets or something, then that is so much simpler. So that's often the preferred way. This is where we use TSIG. Much, much simpler. Over here, because we cannot secure the entities to each other so that they know who the other party is and that he's trustworthy, etc. Instead, we secure the data. So TSIG is basically about server security. You authenticate the other party. And once you've authenticated the party, you will just trust the data that he sends you. The NSEC is about securing the actual data. You don't care who the other party is, because the data itself is secure. It's a more complicated design, but it's a necessary design when you have so many involved parties. So, <coughs> when you want to validate something, 
that could be uh, somewhere down the tree. You want to reach the, the web server of netnode, .se, and you want to look up the quad A record for that, and you want to know that you're actually talking to the right v6 web server, etc. Uh, when you do this validation, it may turn into a chain, as I showed you uh, a couple of slides back with this um, hash of the child key and the key signing data further down, etc. So it's a, it's a chi chain to follow. But if you go in the other direction and, and you start down with the thing that you want to verify and work your way up the signature chain, at the end, or rather at the root of the signature chain, you need to have something that you trust. And this is called the trust anchor. At the end of the day, you need to be able to chase the signatures back to something that you have decided to trust. And note that deciding to trust is basically a policy statement. It's a conscious decision on behalf of someone to decide to trust this key. Signatures generated by this key, I will trust. And this policy statement can be made in various ways. It could be made by the name server configure uh, admin person configuring a trusted key inside a recursive server saying validate against this key, this key is trusted. And then the recursive server will not question this because it's been told to trust that key. And that's why it's a policy. Or you could acquire the key some other way. But in the end it will be a policy statement. So once you have trusted keys you will have several different types of data. You will have unsigned data, obviously. No way of validating that. You will have signed data, which is covered by a trusted key. So you can chase the signed data's signature back to the trusted key that you trust, and then you're basically fine. But it could also be that you have signed data that you cannot chase back to a trust anchor that you, that you have configured. It's still signed, it's just that it's not signed by a key that you can, that you can verify. It's, it's a bit like seeing someone signing their email with their PGP key, and you see there's a nice shiny PGP signature here, but he, he's not in my <laughs> key ring, so it really doesn't give me any security or anything. So you have to distinguish between something being signed and something being validatable and it's only validatable if you can chase it back to the trust anchor that you have configured. And typically you should get them out of band, and you should verify them really carefully, etc. And in practice, we need something that is sufficiently, how should I put it, simple and efficient. So here is how to do this in Unbound, and I see a typo here. I apologize for that. That stuff should be up here. This is me having increased the, the, the font size or something so it didn't fit. Um, so in the unbound configuration you can add uh, the attribute trust anchor and then uh, a public key. Because the keys are public keys here. The private keys typically you should not distribute around. Um, and the format of the public key we will look at later on, but you can just look at the owner name, which is the name of the zone, the type is DNS key, uh, various secret bits that I won't get into, and then you have the actual key, dat key data. An alternative to this, which is sometimes a bit more convenient, is to instead use trust anchor file and refer to an external file. The advantage of using an external file is that then you can have other software that maintains your trust anchors in that file rather than to have your external software rewrite your, your name server configuration, which is sort of dangerous. The next version after that is to use auto trust anchor file, which is a, a mechanism by why you're saying you, name server, you are allowed to maintain the trust anchors in this file yourself <coughs> through an automated mechanism to track key rollovers. And that is something called um, RFC 5011. And RFC 5011 
basically deals with a mechanism by which someone who rolls their keys, as in they exchange the old key for a new key, can do this in a way that allows the recursive server to notice, <laughs> allows the recursive server to acquire the new key in band, it can query for it, and the new key will be signed by the old key and it can trust the new key because it's signed by the old key and it can automatically flush the old key at the right time and continue using the new key. That's an automatic rollover system and we have that. Um, without automatic rollover systems, that, that was yet another of those bl blind alleys I spoke about that we sort of diverged into. We, we, we thought this was really cool and we, we had all these trust anchors configured in our name servers and then we started noticing that parts of our namespace went black and that's because some of us rolled their keys and suddenly when you roll the key and you sign with a new key but you try to validate against an old trust anchor which is the, the public key for the old key it will say Signature doesn't match. This is bad data. Don't trust it. And it sort of just goes black. So it's even more dangerous to have old trust anchors configured than to not have any trust anchors configured at all. So we really need these automatic key rollover systems because otherwise it's just impossible to get people to, to always keep all this stuff up to date. And we have them, and they work. And that's why auto trust anchor file is really what people are using now. Because we've signed the root now, we really don't have multiple signed independent signed trees anymore. It used to be the case that Sweden was a signed tree, and we had some other parts that were signed, but they were not tied together. Because the root is signed, they are now mostly tied together. And because they are tied together, we only really need one trust anchor, and that is the trust anchor for root. So the world has become a much simpler place with the root being signed than it was before. Because now we only need to configure one trust anchor. Uh, the unbound package provides a utility to configure this trust anchor. It's a uh, command line utility called unbound anchor. And what unbound anchor does is that it basically fetches the public key for the root, but not over DNS, but rather over HTTPS. And it verifies the signature not by a DNS key, but the signature by an X509 certificate. So it's signed another way to make it out of bound, out of band re related, uh, relative to DNS. And you, you can run that now and then, and it will say that it's the same key, it's still, still the right key, and now it's a new key, and here is the new key. But you really don't need to do that, because the automatic rollover mechanism in built into Unbound and built into other recursive servers will do this automatically for you, given that you use this auto-trust anchor file mechanism, which says you may roll the keys in here, as new keys are being published, and you can just track that automatically. So, how do we verify that DNSSEC actually works? Well, we typically verify this by using a tool like DIG or some web-based equivalent or something. But what should we look for? I mean, there's no real point in, in just looking for all the signature bits because they are sort of hard to verify visually. You need something that does the validation for you and says, this is OK. So the thing that does the validation for you is obviously the recursive server. The recursive server will validate assuming that you've configured a trust anchor. But how does it signal that this is OK? It did validate. And the answer is, it does this through a bit called the AD bit. The bit which means authenticated data. So when you look at the output from dig, at the top of the output it said header, and I said various flag bits, and it said NX domain, and uh, stuff like that. Part of the flag bits are things like query response and authoritative answer and stuff. 
if you see an AD up there, that means authenticated data. It means that the recursive server that is sending this response back to you has done validation and the signature validated. So that's the AD bit. Um, another bit, which is unfortunately important, is the CD bit. The CD bit stands for checking disabled. What do we need the CD bit for? Well, the problem is that if stuff breaks and you try to look something up, and the only thing that you get back is serve fail, and serve fail is just another status code from a name server, just like NX domain and no error, etc. Serve fail means I'm not happy. I, I failed to resolve whatever you asked me to do. It did not work out. But it doesn't really tell you what broke, just that it did not work. Part of the debugging process that you as a DNS administrator has to do then is to figure out the reason. If you can just log into that box, you can look in the logs and you can do various things to, to find more information about where the problem is. But Perhaps the first test to do is to issue the same query again with the CD bit set. Because if the CD bit is set, you're telling the recursive server, do not attempt validation. And then it will just send the answer back if there is an answer. While in the DNS case, if there is an answer and the signature doesn't validate because it's bad, what DNS tells the recursive server to do is to not return the data. And if you cannot return the data, you send a serve fail saying, I failed to return the data you asked for. So the serve fail m does not necessarily say that anything is misconfigured here. It's just saying that I'm unable to give you the answer you're looking for. And one of the reasons could be that this is DNSSEC protecting you. Of course, it could also be that this is DNSSEC protecting you, but not from bad data, but from mismanaged DNSSEC infrastructure. It could be an old signature that should ha have been re-signed. It could be all sorts of DNSSEC-related problems that you want to find out the details of. But the first part is to figure out the reason for the serve fail, and CDBIT helps with that debugging process. We spoke about this. We spoke about this. And then we get to creating a signed zone. So in, in standard DNS, you can basically create your zone, set up your name servers, publish the zone through the name servers, and forget about it. If you don't touch it for two years, it will still just work which is what a lot of us do. With DNSSEC, this is no longer possible, unfortunately. Because with DNSSEC, suddenly we have signatures. And one of the things with signatures is that they have a lifetime. A signature starts being valid at a point in time, and that's wall clock time. And it stops being valid at the second point in time, which is also wall clock time. And a typical signature lifetime is something like a week or a couple of weeks. So if you don't re-sign your zone on a periodic schedule, every single signature will basically go bad and no longer validate. And that means that your zone will no longer be functioning. And you really want to avoid that. So this process of generating keys, using the keys to sign the zone, is not a one-time thing. It's something you need to do periodically. You need to re-sign your zone without fail, regardless of whether you go on vacation or not. And if you fail and you forget about it, everything will, will go black. Uh, keys, we've already seen those a little bit in the, in the Trust Anchor stuff. They are stored in records called DNS keys. And signatures generated by keys are stored in records called RRSIG for resource record signature. And we will look at them in more detail.
When I spoke about how to bridge the delegation cut and having this record in the parent that basically identifies one key in the, in the child, and then I said, you just identify that key and that key can be used to sign other keys. That means that we can generate other keys inside the zone and roll them more frequently. And that's exactly what people do and that's exactly how DNSIC is designed to work. So the key at the apex of the zone, which is the target of this hash, is usually called a key signing key. It's used to sign other keys. While those other keys, they are called zone signing keys or ZS case, because they are signing the zone or all the content in the zone. So the real picture is actually even more complicated than what I showed you before. And the zone signing keys, because they are being used all the time, I mean, if you have a zone with, with lots of dynamic changes that happens all the time, like for instance the .eu zone that changes every five seconds, obviously your zone signing keys will be more or less online and they will be used all the time. So you could argue that depending on, on system design, they have more exposure. And if they have more exposure, perhaps you should change them more often. While on the other hand, the key signing key, which is only used to sign the keys, perhaps that's only used once every 10 days to sign the keys because the, the keys don't change that frequently. So you don't have to have them online and they see less exposure and for that reason perhaps you don't need to roll them quite as often. This is not necessarily a perfect truth. Exposure is, is relative, it's not absolute. It could be that you're using a storage mechanism for all the keys that is safe and then this argument of how often you should roll one or the other sort of doesn't make sense. But what still makes sense is that for operational reasons, you don't want to change the key signing key quite as often because that requires interaction with the parent. So doing it less often just to minimize that interaction is still an operational reason that makes sense. Because the zone signing keys are only used inside the zone and are not in any way involving the parent, they can be rolled whenever. And modern systems, they roll them automatically. It's a completely automated process and no one does anything. Uh, they will just roll on some sort of schedule, like once a month or once every three weeks or something. While rolling the key signing key is still to some extent a process that has manual steps because you, it needs interaction with the parent. And I, I see my colleague in the corner uh, sort of uh, not completely agreeing with me. And I, let me say that I agree with my colleague in the corner. Uh, th 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 there is more to the story. I mean, wh one alternative is that you could argue that the most error-prone operation in DNSSEC where most people stumble and most systems fail is the key rollover. So one choice is to not do key rollovers. Just use the same keys forever. It's still better than not using DNSSEC at all. And if you use the same keys forever, there is no rollover and there is no need for interaction with the parent. That said, there are also things in process to automate this last step of the, the parent interaction. And I don't think we will have to time to play with it here, but that, that is actually in the lab environment, so you can basically get the parent to update your keys, or rather this hash of your key automatically by in the process where you generate the signatures for your own zone and you reload your name server, etc. You, you basically kick the parent and the parent will change to a new hash for your new key. And those things can be automated, but that is not quite as mature as the ZSK rollovers, which are completely automated now. So, signing a zone. We need to generate keys, we need to use the keys to sign, and we need to update the configuration to load the signed version of the zone file rather than the unsigned version of the zone file. And that's more or less it. We will use the utility DNSSEC keygen to generate keys. There are 
an arbitrary number of ways of generating keys. I mean, in the end, I could just walk around this room asking each of you for a word, and then I could take the, the string of words and I could do something with that, and I would come up with some sort of random string, and that could be used as a key. Or I can use pseudo-randomness that I get out of my computer. Or I can use a, a tool like this. So there is nothing magic with DNS keygen that says this is what you have to use. Anything that produces randomness in the right amount is fine for generating keys. But there is difference in quality of randomness. There is real randomness and not so real randomness. It has a bunch of, uh, of arguments which algorithm to use, and I will just tell you to use RSA SHA-256. Um, length of key, whether this is a key signing key or not. If it's a zone signing key, you will not use minus FKSK. If it is a key signing key, you will use minus FKSK. Uh, there is other arguments, and we will use zone, because we are using DNSSEC. The host argument here is something you use for tsig, and that's not what we're doing right now. Name of key is equal to name of zone, and then you need a source of randomness, and at the end of the day, it will generate two files. One file which is called something.key, which is the public key, and one file which is called something.private, which is the private key. An alternative key generator is called LDNS Keygen. That's uh, from the NLNet Labs guys. Uh, it's very similar. Um, the, the reason why we will use the former one now is because the former one, which is a binder tool, DNS Keygen, stores additional metadata with the keys, which is something we are using when we are doing manual signing of the zone. It will be completely irrelevant once we switch to automatic signing of the zone using a signer engine like OpenDNSSEC. But for manual signing, it, it has uses. So LDNS is, is just as fine as a key generator, but together with the manual signing tool, it's less convenient. And here is an example. For a long time, the, the choice of key algorithm was not really an issue. Because, the, the, well, a very, very long time ago, RSA was encumbered by patents and not usable for people outside the US. That time is past. So once RSA was available, everyone just used RSA, and that was fine. No one wants to use DSA because it's slow. Around comes the Russians, and they propose something called GOST, which is a, a suite of crypto algorithms in use in Russia. Um, the problem here is that you cannot really sign a zone with an arbitrary number of different algorithms at the same time, because the packets will become very, very large, and that simply does not scale, and it fragments and everything goes bad. So the concern was at some time, at some point, that it would be impossible for the Russians to use DNSSEC unless we signed stuff with GOST. This turns out not to be the case. The only requirements under Russian legislation, as far as I understand, is that certain Russian information, especially zones by Russian state agencies and stuff like that, has to be signed by an approved algorithm like GOST. But they can do validation of any algorithm. So they can validate the stuff that the rest of us sign with RSA just fine. But when they validate the, what do I know, the, the Russian tax authority and other important stuff, it will probably be validation of a, a signature which is uh, made by a GOST key. Uh, nothing against GOST as technology, it's just that they are, that's a different algorithm. I'm sure there are all sorts of, of nasty backdoors into RSA that uh, the Americans know about, but they don't tell us. I'm sure there are all sorts of nasty backdoors into GOST algorithms that the Russians are not telling us of. So it's uh, the devil you know or the devil you don't. Um, so that doesn't really matter too much for us, although it works fine. 
elliptic curve is really, really popular these days, and there's lots of talk about this. Uh, in particular, there's talk by, by people from Cloudflare, because Cloudflare loves elliptic curve. Um, my view is that, yes, elliptic curve generates smaller signatures, but the size of the packets, as long as you don't sign with four different algorithms at the same time, the size of the packets really isn't an issue today. It works just fine. However, Cloudflare does on-the-fly signing. They sign the stuff at the edge as they give out the response to the query. So they need to optimize for quick signing, which is why they like elliptic curve. The problem is that they're sort of just pushing the problem over to the recipient because validation is much slower. So elliptic curve is fine technology, but I, I want you to be aware that it's not the case that, oh, elliptic curve is the next thing. It's much better than RSA. It's much better in one particular use case for that particular company and their business model, which is fine. I'm, I'm all in favor of the business model, and they do great things. But it's not necessarily the right algorithm for someone who is just signing their zone. It has drawbacks. Once we have the keys, we sign them with the NSX sign zone, and it has lots and lots of parameters. An alternative is to sign with LDNS sign zone, which is slightly similar, or is very similar, but slightly simpler. And here's a bunch of parameters. And here is, um, I think I've lost a slide, actually. No, this is what I was looking for. Here are the DNS sign zone important parameters. Among them, when should the signature start being valid? When should the signature stop being valid? Uh, sources of randomness, etc. In the LDNS sign zone case, extremely similar. What makes DNS sign zone be the preferred choice today as long as you're using manual signing, as in doing this yourself or doing this through cron, is that if you generate a bunch of keys with DNS keygen, DNS keygen will store timing information with the keys that allows DNS sign zone to figure out which key to use when. So you can just use DNS sign zone minus capital S to sign your zone, and it will grovel around in the directory, look for various keys, look at the timing information for the various keys, realize that this is an old key, this is a key which is not, still in not yet in use, and these are the keys I should be using right now. And it will figure that out automatically, which is really... Signing zones manually is error-prone and horrible, but if you have to do it, at least make it as, little as less painful as possible, and this is the way to do that. We will skip these flags, and that brings us to the DNS key record, and the DNS key record looks like this. Uh, lots of parameters, but the only thing we will care about right now is the actual key bits. So these are the public key bits for that key, and the private key bits are obviously over somewhere in secret where I store the private key. There is other information like which algorithm is this and various other things, like is, is this a KSK or not, but we will not get into those details. The RRSIG is also fairly complicated. Again, lots of various flags and bits and stuff. The things we care about is that there is the actual signature data. This is what we will actually validate. There is 
some sort of record that this RR SIG covers. So if we have dot 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 axfr.net A, the IPv4 address for my web server, presumably it also has a quad A for the v6 address of my web server, then there will be one RR SIG A to sign the A RR set and one RR SIG quad A to sign the quad A RR set. So each RR set will have one signature. And this says which RR set is this signature covering. I it looks a bit here like the RR SIG is an independent record. It really isn't. It just looks like an independent record. So if you query for dot 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 axfr.net rr sig, yes, you will get the rr sigs. So you can query for them, but you don't really want to do that because they really belong together with the thing that they are signing. So if you query for dot 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 axfr.net a, you will get both the a rr set and the rr sig together in the same response and they need to travel together because things get cached and if they are cached at the same time in the same place it will still work then a new version of the ARR set with a new IP address for my web server will come around and that will also have a signature attached to it and that will also be cached perhaps in in a different cache somewhere while this is still being cached over here and as long as the RR SIG stays together with whatever it is that it's signing, this is internally consistent and works just fine, and this is also internally consistent and works just fine. So DNS is designed to be a loosely coherent system. We can have different versions of data in, the, in flight at the same time, being in caches in various places. That's fine. But it's important that signatures that are used to validate the stuff actually travel together with the stuff that they're validating so that not the wrong signature is trying to validate the other version of an, of an RR set. So the RR sig is really to be looked at as a property of whatever it is that it's signing in spite of technically being a record. And then there is information like um, when this signature starts being valid and when it stops being valid and this is of course the information that causes its signatures to have to be regenerated periodically. And that brings us to the next lab exercise. Let's see here. So over here I don't know how far you've come with configuring your recursive server, but now you will configure it some more. So all this is done, and I have actually set up the resolve.conf file for you. And we have the configuration of the authoritative server that we spoke about before lunch. And this is done, and this is done. And that brings us to DNSSEC. And here you should, in your recursive server, in your IMR, you should configure a trust anchor so that your name server can do validation. Your recursive name server can do validation. And when you've configured this correctly, you will be able to query for stuff, like here, dig dup 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 dot DNS lab. And you will, among the other flags, you will see the AD flag, which means authenticated data. And when you see that flag, that means that validation is working for your name server, for your recursive name server. The next thing, then you should probably try to, to mess up your, your trust anchor so that it's no longer correct, and then you can try again, and it will not manage to validate anything. Then we get to DNS own signing. And there you should be generating keys. And that's described in detail. And then once you have the keys, you should sign the zone. And this is described. 
and once you've signed the zone, you should update your name server configuration to load the signed version of the zone file instead of the unsigned version of the zone file. And then you get to the secure delegation part. This is where you stop. When you have a signed zone file and you can query your name servers and you will get signed data back, then you stop and raise your hand or wait for me and Barry, etc. And we will do the signed delegation together. Okay? Questions? Everything is absolutely clear. <laughs> so l l let me put it this way. Uh, I, I, I've done this in many countries over many years, and I know that at this point, this is not clear. <laughs> so this is the reason why we're doing the lab exercises, because the lab exercises will basically force the issue of what you don't understand. It's really clear that there are parts here that are not understandable at this point, and you need to do the lab exercise. But don't get stuck on the details. Raise your arm when you don't understand, and we will run around and, and help you out. Okay?